Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon or good morning to all of you, wherever you are. Let me warmly welcome you to this seminar. I'm Yurdi Yasmi, the regional representative of ERI for Southeast Asia. I will be your moderator today. The theme of our seminar is the future of food systems in Southeast Asia post COVID-19. As you all know, since it was declared pandemic by WHO on 11 of March, COVID-19 has affected millions of people in over 200 countries and territories around the globe. In this crisis, safeguarding the food system is critical. The main objective of our seminar is to share information among organizations on the impacts of COVID-19 to food systems in Southeast Asia, one of the fastest growing regions in the world. It is also a forum to discuss initiatives that have been taken so far and what can be done in the future to safeguard the food systems in Southeast Asia. But before we start, I would like to invite Dr. Matthew Morell, the Director General of ERI, to give his opening remarks. Dr. Morell, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Yerdi, and uh, good day to everyone tuned in. Uh, one of the unexpected benefits of the COVID situation is that we've become uh, much more familiar with the technology and the ability to have such uh, webinars. So I want to acknowledge and welcome our esteemed panel from the development sector, government and the private sector. So Dr. David Dor of FAO, Dr. Jiang Feng Zhang of ADB, uh, Mr. Graham Dixie of Grow Asia, and we'll have a message from Dr. Aladdin Rillo of ASEAN. I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues who will be joining us this afternoon, Dr. Jean Ballier, our Acting Director for Research and the Head of Uri's Agri-Food Policy Platform. And uh, you've already heard from Dr. Yerdi Yasmi, who has just recently joined us as Uri's Regional Representative for South Asia. I'm very grateful to FAO, specifically its Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Mr. Zhong Jin Kim, Officer in Charge and Deputy Regional Representative as well as Dr. Yerdi Yasmi for having organized this seminar. This current situation, uh, which we're all uh, finding as the new normal, pushes us to maximize the use of online platforms while we're still maintaining our social distancing. The current situation uh, also necessitates important conversations on pressing matters brought about by the health crisis, which includes the impact on food security. The agriculture sector has proven to be an integral part of society, of course. It is the backbone of most, if not all, economies in Southeast Asia. Now more than ever, we recognize the significant contribution of research to inform policy measures so that we can ensure no one is left hungry amongst those we serve. The crisis is felt widely, but unevenly. The impacts of the pandemic pose immense threats to the health of communities already struggling with hunger uh, and livelihoods uh, of vulnerable farming groups. Impacts on the food system are already felt in terms of drops or shifts in demand, supply disruptions, labor shortages, trade restrictions, among other effects. Ongoing efforts to curb further outbreak have also severely affected the availability and accessibility of farm supplies needed to support food production. Consumer behavior shifts are already evident. They've been stockpiling food and other essential items due to the probability of extended lockdown and other shifts in purchasing behavior. So I'm looking forward to this discussion, which will cover the challenges in food systems amid the COVID-19 situation. The future of food systems in Southeast Asia after the pandemic 
and potential measures to safeguard food systems. These insights will certainly inform policies aimed to ensure availability of safe and nutrition, nutritious food for all. Again, I welcome you to this webinar and I hand you back to our moderator, Dr. Yerdi Yasmin, to take us through the program. Thank you very much for your opening remarks, Dr. Morel. Now, allow me to introduce to you our resource persons. I would, I would request them, if possible, to say a quick hi to all of you when I call their name. First, Dr. David Dow, Senior Economist, FAO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Hello, everybody. Thank you, David. Second, Dr. Jiang Feng Zhang, Director, Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture Division, Southeast Asian De Department of ADB, Asian Development Bank. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Third, Dr. Zhang Bai, Acting Director for Research and Platform Leader, Agri-Food Policy of IRI. Good day to everyone. Thank you. Fourth, Mr. Graham Dixie, the Executive Directors of Grow Asia. Hello, everybody. I'm excited to be part of this process. Thank you. Unfortunately, the ASEAN Secretariat sends its apology. However, I will be reading its statement. At the end of the seminar, Mr. Jong Jin Kim, the officer in charge and the deputy regional representative, FAO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, will provide his analysis on the way forward. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. After a short presentation from each of our panel member, there will be opportunity to ask questions. You can send your questions through the link provided to you. We also encourage you to send your feedback about the seminar by filling in the short survey. Now, I would like to call Dr. David Dow, the first presenter, the senior economist of FAO, to deliver his presentation on FAO's roles in safeguarding the food systems future development priorities. Dr. Dow, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yerdi, and thank you, Matthew. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you to the International Rice Research Institute. FAO is very happy to join with Yeri for this webinar on COVID-19 and its impacts on food, food security in Southeast Asia. What I would like to do is discuss the current risks to food security in the region due to COVID-19 and also discuss a little bit about how food systems will need to adapt um, going forward. So the most vulnerable to food insecurity are those that have lost their jobs. And there's a lot of those people. Had there hadn't, ha if there hadn't been substantial action from governments, um, there would definitely be tens of millions, if not more people suffering from food insecurity in Southeast Asia. Now, in the, short, in the short term, aside from controlling the spread of the virus, ensuring economic access to food is really the most urgent task that, that we all face. Um, in some cases, this may mean giving cash. In some cases, it may mean giving food, um, depending on the situation. Thankfully, government and private sector and individuals have already been doing this, but I think and that's been a big help, but I think we all need to do a bit more um, to minimize the impact of, of COVID-19 on, on so many vulnerable people. Now in past crises, such as the Asian financial crisis in 1997 and 98, the agriculture played an important role in many countries um, by providing unemployment to those who had lost their jobs in urban areas. They can still play that role, but they will be able to play much less of a role than they played in the past this time around. 
It's 20 years later after that crisis. There's been a lot of economic growth since then. Um, there's been a lot of structural transformation of economies. Um, and as a result, agriculture is a much smaller share of GDP than it used to be. In Thailand, for example, compared to 20 years ago, in, in rural areas, farm income now only accounts for about 35% of household income, down from more than half 20 years ago. In India, we see a similar trend. Farm income now accounts for just 39% of rural incomes, mm -hmm. down from more than 70% more than four decades ago. So agriculture will still have a role to play as a buffer by providing some employment, but if this is we're talking about a permanent change to the buffering capacity of agriculture here. It's just becoming less important to the overall economy, and that substantially increases the importance of providing social protection to people who have lost their jobs. Now, while loss of income and employment is the biggest threat to food security in the region, keeping food systems functioning is also of absolutely critical importance. Um, for example, despite the exodus of many people back to rural areas, there may be shortages of labor in agriculture. You may have people going back who um, don't want to do the hard work of agriculture, who don't have the skills to do it, or who may not be able to move around even within rural areas sufficiently due to checkpoints at, at different provinces and different municipalities that stop them from getting to the place where they normally used to work and maybe need to harvest or establish the next crop. This in what farmers reaction then will probably be to resort to mechanization. This will accelerate a trend that has been taking place already. Um, it, the good thing about this, it will increase labor productivity, but in the short term, it may also cause some people to lose employment. And so I think these will also likely to be a permanent change in accelerating us towards more mechanization. Now, food supply chains will change as well. All along the chain, in fact, farms, processing plants, retail markets will need to incorporate physical distancing, not only in the short term, but also in the long term. More storage will be needed in value chains to deal with disruptions although it'll be a challenge to get this additional capacity in place quickly, especially if it involves refrigeration of perishable foods like fish and meat and fruits and vegetables. Another cha change is that food supply chains will likely need to have fewer links in them than they used to in the past. The more links you have, the more, problem the more places where it can be, things can be cut off. For example, some of you may have heard the situation of a Malaysian uh, factory that was making rubber gloves um, and couldn't ship them out because of a shortage of boxes. Um, so we may, the more complex that the chain supply chains are, the more risk there is of things like this happening. Now we'll also want food supply chains to be more flexible in the future, able to deliver different able to deliver food in different types of packaging to different sources of demand like supermarkets, schools, restaurants, regular markets. Um, however, there may be a trade-off between this additional flexibility and efficiency. It's easy to say that companies in the private sector should sell to a wide variety of markets in a wide range of forms, but doing so involves costs. And so I'll be interested to hear more from Graham if he has time uh, to say anything about how the private sector is likely to deal with these trade-offs. Now, in terms of policies, um, there may be moves towards more self-sufficiency. Although to be honest, food supplies are flowing quite well across international borders. There have been some hiccups, but it really hasn't been, been too bad for very long. The reason I think that this will be important is because of comparative advantage, which is a, as a concept is much more important for agriculture 
than it is for the other parts of the economy. You know, a factory can set up in any number of locations or any number of countries. You know, you just need roads, electricity, internet connection, and you can kind of, you're kind of good to go. But you know, you can't efficiently grow a mango or rice for that matter, just anywhere you please. Um, growing these efficiently relies on climate, on soils, on water supplies, and things that can't be easily changed or manipulated. So comparative advantage in agricultural production is something that's much more important than for other sectors of the economy. Um, but in that regard, I'd kind of also like to mention that most Southeast Asian countries already, all of the bigger ones, produce more than 85% of their calories domestically anyhow. So most countries are broadly self-sufficient. Um, the only exceptions to that are Malaysia, really, and the obvious ones that have no choice, uh, Singapore and Brunei. So let, let me, I'll, I'll stop right there um, and look forward to comments from my colleagues on the panel and to questions from everybody else later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dow, for your interesting perspective. Uh, I just would like to recognize the over 500 uh, viewers of this uh, webinar, both who is uh, following live through YouTube and also Erie staff who is using our own channel. So thank you very much to all of you with your great interest in participating in these seminars. The next presenter is Dr. Jiang Feng Zhang, the Director of Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture Division, Southeast Asia Department of the Asian Development Bank. He will be talking about ADB's investment in the food systems in Southeast Asia. New direction post-COVID. Dr. Zhang, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. First of all, I would like to thank Yuri and FAO organizing this virtual seminar and inviting me to speak about the ADB's directions on agriculture and natural resource sector operations in Southeast Asia. The COVID-19 pandemic, which has become a major global crisis, is having severe health, social, and economic impacts in Asia and the Pacific. On 13 April, ADB announced a 20 billion package consisting of loans, grants, and technical assistance to help its developing member countries in Asia and the Pacific, managing the wider ranging consequences of COVID-19. It is important to keep agro-food system functioning and undisrupted during this difficult time while travel restrictions imposed in many countries are saving lives, but also creating economic hardship for farmers and the consumers. We are pleased to note the joint statement issued by the ASEAN Ministers of Agriculture and Forestry on 15 April, reaffirming commitment to ensure food security, food safety and nutrition in the ASEAN region during this outbreak. Promoting rural development and food security is one of seven operational priorities of ADB's strategy 2030. ADB will continue to support farmers and the private sector on agri-food production, processing, transport, marketing, and the trade to ensure food availability accessibility and affordability to all during and after the COVID-19. To help mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the food supply chain and to help build a diverse, competitive, safe and sustainable agriculture and natural resource sector. In the near term, ADB's operations on the sector in the Southeast Asian countries will articulate around the four key themes. 
The first one is on enhancing agricultural productivity and climate and disaster resilience. The second one is on value chain infrastructure and agribusiness development to improve farmers' market connectivity and private sector linkage for agricultural value addition. The third one is on enhancing food safety, quality, and the nutrition, which will not only provide the consumers with confidence in the safety and the nutritional value of the food they are buying, but also provide the producers with a confident and vibrant market and the intent stimulate production, trade, and regional integration. The fourth one is environment and natural resource management for environment sustainability, including management of coastal and marine resources. Across the four key themes, based on the country needs and project design, ADB will invest on policy, infrastructure, and technology in partnership with the stakeholders, including, among others, government agencies, development partners, research institutes, and civil society organizations. On policy support, as example, in Philippines, we are working on a policy-based lending to support the government's key reforms in agricultural trade policy and regulatory framework, public services and finance from the agricultural sector, and the social protection for rural families. We appreciate the support from FAO on this program. On infrastructure, ADB will promote integrated water resources management, improve irrigation efficiency and asset management, and enhance flood and drought risk management. ADB will also finance agricultural value chain infrastructure, such as market access, ICT, market faci facilities, and logistics. To help ensure food safety and quality, ADB will invest in safety and quality control infrastructure and facilities, and ICT-based tools for food traceability. On technology, ADB would like to bring advanced technologies into ADB operations, working with the centers of excellence and the private sector. For example, ERI and the ADB have partnered on developing and disseminating climate resilient water saving rice technologies. The European Space Agency is providing Earth observation services to improve land and water management. The food industry Asia has been supporting GMS countries on strengthening food safety control capacities and piloting barcode-based traceability system. ADB will also promote regional cooperation and integration, private sector development, and public-private partnership. Regional cooperation and integration plays a key role in ensuring agricultural development and food security through South-South cooperation, knowledge sharing and transfer, and trade facilitation. We are starting up a new regional technical assistance to support the GMS countries in implementing the strategy for promoting safe and environment-friendly agro-based value chains in GMS, which was endorsed by the GMS agricultural ministers. ADB's private sector operations department is also actively promoting agribusiness development in Southeast Asia and will consider innovative transactions such as partial risk guarantees to banks lending to farmers, supply chain finance, and direct equity investments in agribusiness companies that have long-term financial viability and have the potential for scalable impact. In summary, through its soaring and non-soaring operations, ADB will help DMCs rebound from the COVID-19 with rural employment generation.
by supporting the country's agro-food system, privatizing productivity enhancement, value chain development, food safety and nutrition, and natural resource management. This will lead to sustainable and resilient rural development and food security in Southeast Asia to further reduce poverty, address inequality, and promote the rural urban linkages. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhang, for your comprehensive overview of ADB's investment in the region. I really appreciate it. Um, I would like to request my colleagues, Marco, uh, to present a slide how people can ask questions because there has been requests on this. Thank you, Marco, for showing this uh, um, slide. I would request audience out there to submit their questions as they hear the presentation through this Menti platform. Marco? Marco, the do you... The instructions on how to submit questions using Menti are currently on the screen. And Yuri, we would also love to hear back from the audience uh, with general feedback. And that's where the second URL comes in. Please provide us with your feedback on this event. Thank you. Thank you for that, Marco. That's very useful. Again, I would like to acknowledge all the participants who are participating from different places. About five minutes ago, I was informed over 650 participants are actually participating in this live event. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Jean Bailly, Acting Director for Research and Platform Leader, Agri-Food Policy at ERI. Dr. Bailly will be talking about ERI's research priorities now and in the future. Dr. Bailly, please. Uh, many thanks, uh, Jordi. Uh, good afternoon or good morning again to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I would like to start by recognizing that one characteristic of this crisis is that uh, we have moved from a local health issue to a global and more uh, multi-sectoral crisis. Food supplies have been disrupted due to measures put in place to control the spread of the virus. So if anything, COVID has shown a high degree of interdependence between animal, human, and environmental systems. It has stressed the need to revisit the way we understand, measure, and, and respond to risks. It also means that we need to improve our collective preparedness if we want to be ready when the next uh, COVID-type crisis strikes. So at ERI, our ambition is to develop rice-based food systems that are resilient to a variety of known and unknown shocks through technologies, practices, and policies. Asia, as we heard, is home to 55% of the world population. It is the rice basket of the world. Research programs in Asia must continue and expand in order to meet demands for food security at all times. Rice consumption in Africa is growing rapidly, yet production is not keeping pace. African countries spent, or, or spent over six billion last year to import rice from Asia. The unification process between Africa Rice and ERI will generate a single research program, and our ambition is to make Africa race uh, rice self-sufficient uh, as a continent. ERI has been operating in research for uh, 60 years now and constantly adapting its research capacity to a changing context. This period is no exception. But first, we need to understand, and that's one role of for research, understand the impacts of COVID-19 on the rice sector in particular, but on food systems more in general. We know that the effects are widespread, but they are felt differently in different countries and different families. So we have started some country surveys and partner intelligence to assess rice supply stability. We also want to monitor the situation and uh, whether there are risks of food shortages in the near future or in the medium term. Are there risks of price spikes? 
We have also studied some modeling exercises and foresight. We want to define scenarios and want to simulate different outcomes on production, consumption, prices, employment, incomes, and of course, food security and nutrition security. We have already identified some key research areas in response to this COVID crisis. So we heard that already COVID-19 has led to a labor shortage in many places that can affect many critical stages of transplanting, weeding, and irrigation control because these are labor intensive. So ERI is already looking at options to accelerate mechanization to reduce dependency on labor where possible. Transport and distribution uh, channels uh, networks have been disrupted by the COVID pandemic. So our research will increasingly focus on the role of the middle chain. It is often referred to as the hidden middle, although it is now obvious that it plays an essential role in well-functioning value chain. So ERI research will investigate options to build more resilient middle chains to guarantee the supply of inputs for agriculture seeds, fertilizers, for example. The role of good nutrition to strengthen the immune system is also well recognized. More zinc and iron have documented benefits in presence of viral infections. So ERI is already looking at ways to increase the mineral and vitamin content in rice grain. And we have uh, also seen Unfortunately, countries looking inward to improve their resi resilience to external shocks, while the key word is cooperation. In its policy-oriented research, ERI will focus on the, uh, more on the role of trade and other forms of international cooperation. COVID has only reinforced the conviction that the future research will require more system thinking around system efficiency, and not only productivity, and more interdisciplinary research. Our research today goes beyond rice. It embraces the concept of rice-based agri-food systems. We recognize that farmers do not only grow rice. Diversification strategy include, and will continue to include, rice, because this crop offers stability and remains a staple of choice. ERI will continue to adapt to a complex reality, a changing world by promoting interdisciplinary research, breaking scientific silos, encouraging and sometimes forcing breeders, biochemists, physiologists, agronomists, engineers and economists to work together and deliver as one team. Looking into the future, ERI's research is articulated around five major impact areas. Nutrition and food security, climate change, the environment, prosperity, and social equity. Each one of these challenges is likely to become even more challenging in a post-COVID world. More evidence will be needed to adopt and reform policies to achieve impact at scale in these five critical areas. To me, this only means that we need more research than ever before. And at ERI, we stand ready for the challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bai, for such a very uh, concise and clear presentation on ERI's uh, research priorities. Um, <clears throat> The next speaker is Mr. Graham Dixie, the executive director of Grow Asia. He will discuss the smallholders and food value chains, a private sector perspective. As we all know, in the food system, private sector is a key uh, a stakeholders and an important player as well. The floor is yours, Mr. Dixie. Thanks a lot, Ludi. Uh, and, and thanks to IRI and FAO for organizing this. It's certainly impressive to get 650 people online. In December, 
we were asked by FAO to do a consultation with the private sector. We spoke to 50 companies right across the region and 11 networks. And, and the points they raised, and there was a consensus, was their fears about the food system. And they talked about environmental degradation. They talked about climate change. They made an emphasis on food, on, on nutrition, on health, on food safety. And they worried a lot about long-term productivity with a declining farming population, an aging farming population, and shortages of labor. But they showed extreme prescient by emphasizing their deep concerns about disruptive and major events. Um, and, and I'm very pleased to see that, uh, that the, these, these points were raised by IRI and ADB as areas that they were going to work on. But then moving to COVID, and, and um, we've touched on very well the fear of prices, the worry of those would be compounded by people not having incomes, uh, and the, the labor issues. But what I wanted to focus on was three longer term issues which are which need to be resolved that are uh, revealed by COVID uh, some of our weaknesses in our food systems. I mean, the first one has been rural logistics and the problems of getting product from the producer to the consumer. The second one is the issue of cash flow, how money is being locked up and it's not getting down the value chain so that people are not in a position to buy their next set of seeds. And the, the third one is the changing consumer. The consumer has changed the way they operate in COVID. They are going to different shops, they're buying from convenience stores, they're showing greater interest in cooking their own foods, they're particularly interested in fresher products, they're increasingly interested incidentally in local supply chains and if they can they are buying product online um, and you have the enduring problem of how do you communicate with large numbers of farmers which we've always had and what we've seen is that the governments have responded well in the region after an initial hiatus that they have opened food lanes or green lanes and mostly those have been working and the ASEAN secretariat and the group of council of, of ministers have committed to keeping the flow going and have asked for multi-stakeholder solutions to, de to develop marketing systems which are resilient and sustainable and robust. So turning then to what is Grow Asia doing? I mean, just to give you a sense, we, we have that we work on the premise that if you can get the public sector, the private sector and the producers to work together, the balance of probabilities is they can come up with better solutions. And that's what we've created across the region in six countries. We have something like 500 partners, half from the private sector, the rest from that mix of government, civil society, producer organizations. They break into working groups. They do something like 50 different projects. And when we do the numbers, this is something like a million farmers are engaged. 250 of them, we, a thousand of them we know have changed their activities, increased income of about 80 million, and that for every dollar invested in the network, we leverage another seven dollars from government and the private sector and the farmers themselves. We work at the, the country partnership level, and mainly there, those are uh, working on individual value chains and increasingly moving to national value chains. But there, something we have been doing is that those country partnerships have been collecting the fragmented information on what's actually happening on the ground, consolidating it together and disseminating it, not only to their network, but engaging in conversations with governments. And things like the good practices of food chains and food lanes have been disseminated from Philippines to Papua New Guinea, as an example. But then there's the issue about um, how do we work regionally? Um, and one of the big issues when you talk to the CEOs of large and small agribusinesses and you say, what will positively transform your relationship with the smallholder farmer? They pause for a moment and then they say digital. They say that they're terrified of smallholder farmers contaminating their, their supply chains. So traceability becomes really important. Logistics becomes really important. How do you lower transaction costs when you're dealing with thousands of smallholder farmers? Um, if you are a banker, how can you identify which of those farmers are really likely to repay your loan, etc.? 
So digital is very important, but we've discovered something really interesting in the surveys that we've done around farmers, and I think it's worth referencing, that mostly farmers use their phones as a tool to make calls, but also 20 to 40% of them operate in chat rooms. But when you get to digital applications, agricultural applications, uh, less than 1% are actually using its derisory. So the question then comes out is, how can we use those chat rooms as a platform from disseminating information, whether that's around health or whether that's around improved productivity. And then turning finally to COVID itself, you know, what we do is that by bringing those disparate parties together, you can make better decisions. So on May the 15th, in partnership with the World Economic Forum and the ASEAN Secretariat, we will bring together about 80 partners for a conference call in which we will um, talk about the problems of COVID and the private sector will step forward and talk about what they can do and how they can, they can help and f solve some of the problems. And I think what will come out of that is four working groups. One will be around rural logistics. Part of that will be around, um, you know, if we could only apply the creativity that has been applied to urban logistics, to rural logistics. You know, how can we f um, fill in backhauls by consolidating loads? Then there's the issue of cash. Um, and, you know, at the moment, farmers can't take credit card payments. So mobile money becomes really important, not only to release the flow of money in the cash flow, but also enabling farmers to do, operate in different ways, maybe to sell directly online. And we have these wonderful examples in, in Cambodia and Myanmar of wave money, wing money, which is really sort of operating at the same kind of level that we've seen in Kenya. And then there's the issue of digital enhanced marketing. You know, farmers had difficulty when the food and, veg, veg, um, and beverage sector cut off to them. They need to be able to switch quickly and have a robust and flexible marketing system. And then finally, there's the issue of how do we get messages out to farmers, maybe using um, the chat rooms and using some of the interesting developments that come out of the commercial sector, where they have learned how to use influencers that can walk the chat room and guide the conversation so that we can get out technical and health messages. I'll leave it there, Yuri. Uh, thank you so much, Graham. Very interesting presentation. Um, Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as I said earlier, ASEAN sends its apologies, but we received the statement from the ASEAN Secretariat, which I will read very briefly. Such statement has also been recognized by Dr. Zhang from ADB in his presentation. Below are some of the excerpts from the statement. Statement of the ASEAN Ministers on Agriculture and forestry in response to the outbreak of coronavirus disease to ensure food security, food safety, and nutrition in ASEAN. We, the ASEAN ministers on agriculture and forestry, express our deep concern over the outbreak of coronavirus disease 2019, which has affected the lives of people and economies, including food, agriculture, and forestry sectors in ASEAN and globally. We emphasize the importance of food, agriculture, and forestry sector, and urge to ensure that essential, safe, and nutritious produce can continue to reach ASEAN markets during the outbreak of COVID-19. In order to contribute to overcoming the challenges posed by COVID-19 outbreak, and to ensure sustainable supply of sufficient affordable, safe, and nutritious food that meet the dietary requirements of ASEAN population, we agree to reaffirm our commitments in the implementation of the Statement of ASEAN Ministers on Agriculture and Forestry on Food Security and Nutrition to improve storage, preservation, transport and distribution technologies, and infrastructure to reduce food and secure insecurity, food nutrient loss and waste. Minimize disruptions in regional food supply chains by working closely together to ensure that markets are kept open and transportation of agricultural and food products are facilitated 
and that quarantine and other non-tariff measures do not impede or slow down the free flow of agricultural and food products in the region. So these are some of the excerpts from the uh, ASEAN statement. As I mentioned, we will see about making this available online somehow so that you can actually see the full statement online. Okay, with that, we have completed all presentations from the presenters. Now I will be asking one question to each presenter before we address various questions that we already received from the audience. I will start with uh, Mr. Dixie. Mm. Well, Mr. Dixie, what do you think is the most important role of private sector to safeguard food systems? Mm. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, I'm reminded of some fascinating research findings, which that if you track the number of people who die of starvation from 1860 to the current day, between the period of 1860 and 1960, on average, 500 people per million died. From 1970, that has dropped to 1 30th, to about 13. And that has been achieved by two things. One is the increase in productivity, and the other one is the post-harvest systems. Now, if you drill into more detail about productivity, that's the result of research, the plant breeders, the fertilizer, the mechanization. And if you look at the post-harvest, that's roads, that's trucks, that's um, infra, uh, um, ITC infrastructure, so you can move production away from areas of surplus to areas of deficit. All of those, it shows a great problem if you're trying to disentangle what is the private sector and what's the public sector. So the first point I would make is, actually it is public-private producer solutions that we need to be working with. The, the same thing is that when you get both to work, you need to have a shared vision of what is the future that you want. And, and I think it's worthwhile thinking of the scenarios. I mean, do we want um, lots of smallholder farmers, organic production, small supply chains? Would that feed the cities? Or do we want a cadre of younger, better farmers who can make a reasonable livelihood as farms? farmers or are we thinking of a few big farms or even some of the thinking of, of moving a farm of food production into factories i think if we have a clear mental image of what we would expect to see coming out and i do emphasize that i think that there will be less farmers but we need to be able to get better farmers um, and that they need to be able to make an income and that is going to be based on productivity but lowering transaction costs lowering their input costs um, and probably farming a larger area. But I suspect that they will be increasingly supported by a network of local businesses flying the drones, doing the plowing, providing the labor gangs. Let's create a clear mental image of what we want in the future. Let's not step back, but let's step forward to create a, a, an inclusive business for a farming system which incorporates farmers, but also the way the food demand is changing. Over. Uh, thank you, Graham. Very interesting. Uh, and of course, to create this mental image of the future, we need to involve all the stakeholders. Yeah. We will have to make sure that no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, answer, uh, Graham. I would like to ask the next question to Dr. Dow from FAO. Uh, could you please elaborate uh, the policy options that the government should consider in safeguarding food systems? And why do countries need to work together as urged by the United Nations? David? Thank you, Yerdi. Um, countries need to work together today for the same reason that it's always been a good idea to work together. And that's so that we can all learn from one another. The virus has shown us, if nothing else, there is a huge amount that we don't know. We're really quite ignorant about a lot of things. And the only way we can reduce this ignorance is by learning from each other. But it's not just countries that need to work together. We all need to work together. And in particular, I think as I'd like to emphasize what Graham was saying earlier, and that is collaboration between the public, private, public and private sectors will be essential to navigate this crisis. Um, most of our food is distributed by private firms, whether that be micro 
small, medium, or large-scale enterprises. And when we put in place virus containment measures, there will be problems. There will be disruptions that need to be solved. And the only way to solve these is to get everybody talking to one another and figuring out a way to get around the problems. So that's why it's really important to work together. Now, in terms of policy options, I would like to mention several, I guess. Um, one is to expand social protection. There's so many people out there who have serious problems accessing food. Two, uh, avoid export restrictions. Uh, there's been a few fits and starts, but overall I'd say Southeast Asia seems to be doing pretty well on that score so far. Um, the situation's much better than it was 10, 12 years ago during the world food crisis. Three, um, we all need to collaborate, as I mentioned earlier. And four, I would say, don't forget the importance of long-term investments in solid scientific infrastructure to conduct research, generate innovations in food production, and all along the value chain. Innovation has always been essential, and it's even more so now when we are faced with such tremendous uncertainties. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, David, for your uh, 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 clear and really important uh, answer to this question. Uh, my next question is to my colleague, uh, uh, Jean Bailly. Uh, Jean, rice is such an important staple for 4 billion people. Uh, so the question is, do we need to worry about rice availability this year? I'm talking about 2020. Do we have, do we have enough rice for everyone? Uh, thank you, Jordi, for the question. Um, well, many things can happen in a year. Uh, it's a long period of time. Uh, we, we, we need to distinguish, in my opinion, the short term let's say the next three, three, four months and the medium term, let's say four to 12 months. So in the short term, there is evidence that there is no reason to expect supply problems. Uh, in the last rice harvests were good, even better than expected globally. Stocks are high, higher than ever before, and much higher than what they were in, in 28 and 2011. So to take examples in China, which is both the main producer and consumer of rice, stocks have reached record high of 110 million plus tons and just below the level of annual consumption. But it's massive. In India, the second largest consumer uh, and world, world largest exporter, stocks are sufficient to cover several months of consumption. So uh, a, a shortage of rice in the short term is unlikely. Uh, however, the picture can change rapidly in the medium term. So any shock, I was said before, any shock on production that could result in a lower than expected harvest could trigger a, a price crisis. Likewise, a massive surge in demand uh, fueled by panic buying, for example, could also trigger a, a price rise. Or decisions, as, as, as was uh, uh, recalled uh, by many speakers before me, limiting the flow of uh, rice uh, within countries and between countries, including export bans and over trade restrictions, could all um, precipitate a price surge. Uh, and and, and in, in that, in spite of good markets fundamental. So the combination of supply and, and demand side effects uh, and wrong, yes, wrong policy decisions could result in another price crisis of the sector. It's possible. It's, it's not likely, but it's possible. So the potential impact of uncoordinated measure, here again, cooperation matters. So governments deciding export bans could be catastrophic. So it is reassuring to see that Vietnam and others have resumed their exports. Uh, they are moving away from this trend of you know, being uncooperative. Lessons have been learned from the previous crisis. We know that there is still a risk of collective action problem whereby the decision uh, made by one government to improve its own situation in the short term can make the situation worse for all the others. So there is also a risk that when government decides to adopt a competitive behavior uh, rather than cooperative, it will be followed by other governments triggering a, a, a chain reaction. 
So when, when government take unilateral decisions, they can fuel the problem uh, rather than solve it. So by contrast, we have also learned from the previous crisis that good coordination in policies, trade facilitation, partnerships, talking to the private sector can relax the tensions in markets. So, so again, we have to work collectively together, private and public sector, and make sure we share information. Thank you. Great. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Bai, uh, for your uh, answer to this important question. Now, uh, I will go to Dr. Zhang of ADB. There is a huge interest by non-governmental organizations to engage with ADB projects or programs in relation to food systems post-COVID-19. So what, would, what will be the mechanisms for such engagement, uh, Dr. Zhang? Thank you, Yodi. ADB operations, uh, in particular on agriculture and the rural development, uh, have benefited from the contributions of non-government organizations, and we will continue to partner with NGOs. For example, NGOs can help with farmers' mobilization, awareness raising, community development, gender mainstreaming, technology dissemination, and uh, livelihood enhancement. So in terms of how the NGOs can be engaged in ADB operations, here please just allow me to cite one specification in ADB's procurement reg regulations. It mentions that where in the interest of project sustainability or to achieve certain specific social objectives of the project, it is desirable on the selected project components to call for the participation of local communities or non-government organizations in the delivery of services. The procurement procedure, specifications, and contract packages should be suitably adapted to reflect these considerations, provided these are efficient and result in value for money. So I would just suggest that any organizations which are interested in ADB projects, please check ADB website, the ADB Business Center, which provides guidance for individuals, companies, and organizations seeking consulting, project, project procurement, and other business opportunities with ADB. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Uh, we are very happy for the openness of ADB and uh, thank you for your suggestion on how uh, you know, non-governmental organizations out there can uh, find information about their potential engagement uh, with you. With that, you know, we have completed um, our first part of the uh, Q&A. We will start uh, taking some questions from the audience. Uh, in this case, I would like to request my colleagues, Marco, to read the first two questions. Marco? Okay, Yuri. Uh, the first question I'm going to read has been asked by multiple people in slightly different ways. But the generic term is, for example, the, the, the one like this. In India, there's a huge surge in the reverse migration to the rural areas. Do you think this is an opportunity to accelerate the production with their capacity skill building on mechanization. So that was the first question. And the second question is to Dr. Balier. And the question is, what are the thrusts of your reform policies that will address social equity, which is a part of Erie priorities that you mentioned? And the question is from Ping Peria in the Philippines. Uh, thank you, Marco. Uh, the first questions about the returnees uh, uh, labors, I think this is uh, relevant for all the speakers, but probably I would like to request uh, Dr. Dao from FAO to, to answer this. Uh, uh, David? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Well, I mean, it, what happens really depends on, on a number of, of factors. I mean, 20 years ago when we had the um, the Asian financial crisis. Um, lots of people went back to the countryside um, in Indonesia. And 
and farm operations became much more labor intensive. Um, so there wasn't really a push to mechanization from that. I mean, it, you know, on the face of it, all the labor migrating back should delay mechanization. Um, but what, you know, whether it does delay mechanization or not, though, may, maybe it will postpone it. it. It really could happen. It depends if those people are willing to work. Um, you know, after years of getting, you know, working in the urban sector and at desk jobs, maybe some of these people don't want to get down there and harvest rice or transplant rice anymore. Um, so if they don't want to do it, um, or or often, you know, if they can't do it because maybe maybe they're used to working in nearby barangays and nearby villages and neighboring provinces, and if they can't get there because of um, you know checkpoints and things like that, then then the then the farmers won't get the benefit of their labor, and and they will have no choice but to re resort to mechanization. But if if labor is moving around at least a little bit, and the people want to um, work in in the in harvesting the crop and things like that, then then this COVID will delay the onset of mechanization. So it really could go either way, and it may go different ways in different locations. Thank you, David. Uh, before I move on to Jean, I would like to invite uh, maybe Graham or Dr. Jean for. Do you want to respond to the first question? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can say this, that, that uh, you know, David's right. I mean, what happens with an FAO's work has shown this, that um, mechanization doesn't replace labor. It, it, it comes in when there's a shortage of labor. And generally, when these kind of events have happened, people will revert back, a few may change. But I think the bigger story is that if you map out what happens with countries and the proportion of people that are in primary agriculture, it continues to drop. And I don't see that there will be a massive change in that. Thank you, Graham. Uh, let me check with Dr. Zhang. Uh, would you like to say something about the first question? Yes, thank you, Yodi. And also here we also keep in mind that there's also very good opportunities in the rural areas for these people coming back, for example, to come start up with some small business or agriculture, some micro or small uh, business. And this can also help to generate, for example, employment, not only from the person himself or herself, we we'll also have spillover uh, activities and as I mentioned earlier, for example, from ADB side, we would like to help to promote the value chain development, basically to help to link up with the farmers, including the smallholder farmers with the market. And part of the services we can provide is also to transfer some specific technical knowledges to these people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. So now I would like to invite uh, my colleague, John to address the research question, question number two. Jean, you're yes, muted. Yes, I'm mute, sorry. Thank you. So, uh, yes, I understand the, the, the question uh, re relates to um, uh, social equity and, and what could be done from a, a policy level. Maybe first uh, start by by acknowledging the the, the importance uh, of the of this problem. I mean, in the rice sector, just to take one example, uh, the, the 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 work done by women uh, in this field uh, is essential, in particular for very specific tasks. So so it's very important to recognize that transplanting and weeding, for example, is is primarily done where mechanization is not, is not very, very high, uh, done by women. So there, there, there are also traditionally, women are traditionally responsible, of course, for the care of children, but also of the elderly people, and they prepare food. And so all that needs to be understood as a, as a system. Uh, and so there, there is a need to actually have uh, policies that look at all these dimensions of the role of women, and, and, and social equity also look at youths and who have different problems. So I think that in a, in a post-COVID world, uh, what we would like to do as Erie is draw the attention on these, on, these, uh, on these issues, on the importance of the role of women and youth. But the, the key here is to position these two categories of, of agents 
uh, as entrepreneurs and make sure that they are they are understood as change agents in the in the system to modernize the sector or actually to make sure that they benefit from the sector they participated in. So tapping the potential of new technologies, for example, that could be a policy option, making sure that we turn the, the, the agriculture sector and rice in particular as a more attractive sector. Uh, so we have started dialogue on policies like that with a number of governments. Uh, the key is to make rice, for example, rice sector, rice production, a, a business of choice, not a default position. Uh, uh, and, and we need policies that are more affirmative uh, with specific targets and support for women and youth. It has to be uh, uh, moving away from business as, as usual and some, some affirmative action is needed, I think. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's very interesting about the involvement of youth and, you know, and uh, women in agriculture. And I think uh, perhaps you can give just one example, John, uh, the kind of technologies that IRIS has been using, you know, that would require, you know, uh, the involvement of potentially youth, you know, youth has not been so interested in agriculture by default. Uh, as you said, if we make this as an entrepreneur, uh, maybe youth, you know, would be interested to re-engage in agriculture sector. Yes, and you mentioned that before. I think Graham mentioned that as well. You know, there are mobile technology, mobile-driven technologies, but there is also all this digital space where 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 we can see uh, youth, you know, thriving and trying to uh, uh, to find that. Uh, agriculture is not about the past. It is it is looking into the future, and mm -hmm. they can adjust and they can adapt a number of technologies to make it a very modern way of working, uh, provided provided the policies are in place to make sure that that is supported, and that means the right investments to make sure that they have access to internet, that all these infrastructure are in place. They don't want to be. They don't want to live in remote areas where they don't have connections. For example, that is that is a sine qua non condition. Just to cite one. Great, that is a really good example, Jean. Thank you very much. Um, now uh, I'm sure, uh, Marco. As I understand from you, we have so many questions. Uh, can we go to the next two questions, Marco? Of course, Jordi. Yes, we have enough questions to fill a couple of hours. Uh, couple of hours more. Uh, the next question is directly aimed at the representative from the Asian Development Bank. And the question poser uh, uh, states it as follows. Uh, what you said sounds like business as usual, but what will be the key differences of ADB's investment portfolio before and after COVID-19? And then there's a question that is for uh, FAO, ADB, and ASEAN, uh, and for Grow Asia. Um, how are these organizations working to develop a regional response to COVID-19? Uh, the question uh, uh, asker says, surely this is something countries cannot and shouldn't deal with alone. Uh, thank you, Marco. Uh, the first question is uh, for Dr. Zhang. So please, Dr. Zhang. Thank you. Uh, this is a very challenging question. <laughs> um, what is the significant difference we need to look into? I will see uh, three points. Uh, the first key point is in terms of, for example, uh, the marketing uh, connection of the works we are supporting. For example, ADB has been supporting this uh, uh, irrigation infrastructure uh, for a long time in different countries. And in the past, uh, what we usually do is basically just look into the irrigation infrastructure, rehabilitation, operation, and the maintenance. However, what we have not done much in the past is specifically to help to look into how we can orient the production towards the demand of the market. So this is the major difference uh, ADB is doing and will do, look into the market demand and then provide the needed support 
to the farmers, including uh, te technical support, skills enhancements, as well as needed infrastructure support. The second thing I will mention is in terms of look into the food safety and the nutrition part. This is something also uh, we will need to strengthen more, especially within the COVID-19 as we have seen right now. And from nutrition and the safety side, maybe let me just cite one example ADB is looking into right now, is that the ADB is working on one project in uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, and the Lao PDR, look into the close border livestock health and the value chain development. As we know very well, basically human health is linked with the animal health and linked with the environment health. These three parts are closely linked with each other, animal health, human health, and the environment health. And for this specific GMS livestock value chain and the cross-border animal disease control, which we will do, we will specifically look into how to address this kind of linkages. And we will specifically look into how to help, for example, the GMS countries in improving the quality standards and in also look into the standardizing uh, there's some trade quality requirements across the countries. Another important aspect is also how to bring in, for example, technologies from International Livestock Institute and other organizations. The third major part of the difference I will see is that in terms of technologies, we would like to look into more this kind of adoption as well as dissemination of technologies by the farmers and for the farmers and look into more integrated solutions. That's why uh, in my presentation earlier, I have also mentioned about the works that we are doing uh, with the different organizations. And in terms of the technologies, it will also be different than what we did in the past we would also like to look into more innovative way of scaling up the dissemination of technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhang. This uh, uh, livestock uh, health example is really, really nice uh, in, in, in uh, the Mekong region. Thank you so much for that. Um, Certainly, the second question would actually require the other three presenters to <laughs> to say something about it. Uh, but I will start maybe with uh, David, and then Grimes, and then John. So David, over to you. Thank you, Yerdi. Um, I, think, I think FAO is supporting a regional approach in at least a couple of ways. Um, probably the most important is by sharing knowledge and experiences across countries, um, how the how the details of, of things work. I mean, for example, in expanding social protection programs, um, how does, what does experience tell us, um, past experience maybe from disasters and things like that, about um, expanding social protection horizontally um, by bringing in more beneficiaries, expanding vertically by increasing the benefits um, to existing beneficiaries and how, how to simplify, how much, how we can simplify administrative processes um, and maybe relax some of the requirements of programs um, in certain crisis situations. So I think, you know, and then of course, within agriculture um, and, and other, and, and throughout the agriculture sector. So sharing knowledge across countries, I think is, is a really important part of FAO's regional approach. And then I think the other the other part of the regional approach is by is just making sure that countries understand the advantages of keeping trade open and, and making sure that that trade is facilitated across countries, um, you know, in all times, but especially in times of crisis. 
Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, Graham? Uh, thanks very much. Um, Ron Manuel, who was Obama's chief of staff, um, was quoted as saying, never let a crisis go to waste. And what he means by that, it's not cynicism, it is that at these moments, people are much more likely to make a change. An example being my, my, my son-in-law is a doctor. His hospital has been arguing for electronic records of patients for five years. When the COVID happened, within two weeks, they got them. So how can we use the opportunity, particularly to think about the long-term problems in the food supply system? Um, and so what we will be doing, and probably on May the 15th, is bringing together the ASEAN, the Secretary General of the ASEAN, um, a group of um, private sector companies, plus members of the development sector and um, producer organizations and for a conversation, for a roundtable discussion, which will, uh, a very brief summary of what are the situations that I've outlined. Um, then there will be some statements by some of the major agribusinesses of their support for working in a public-private sector partnership to solve the problems coming out of COVID. Examples there would be Bayer, CP, Cinemas, and so on. And then, it would, uh, then there will be an explanation about how working groups work. And if you can get multi-stakeholder partnerships to work, you can come up with better solutions. There will then be about 50, 60 different companies online, a broad spectrum of companies, including hopefully things like Facebook, um, the, the MUFG Bank, and so on, um, and, and some of the other things that are working in the digital space to have a discussion and they will pay, bring forward what are the problems that they have actually been facing, what are the solutions. What will come out of that is this, four working groups, and they will probably be around digital solutions, around um, marketing solutions, around logistics, around cash and around information. And, the pri and these will um, have a moderator. They will each meet with uh, once a week for four weeks for about an hour to discuss and bring together the public sector, the private sector and the producers to discuss and to iron out between them what are the real issues what and to come up with a common vision of what they think would be the solutions and then after four weeks so this would be around about late june those four groups will present to the asean secretariat and the grouping of public private sector partnerships that's what they came out of that so you there have three four or five action plans of what needs to be done and who needs to do what and these would be the trigger for action plans to solve some of the longer term problems of COVID. Over. Uh, thanks, Graham. It's nice to hear how you, know, you work, uh, you channel this through the ASEAN body, which is very important regional body here. Um, uh, John, do you want to say, uh, to respond to this question too? Uh, are, you, are, you, are you asking Jean, uh, Jean Ballier? Or? Um, Dr. Bailly. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, well, I just would like to add uh, a couple of points because I think the the, the response by other speaker was already quite uh, quite useful and 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 uh, complete. So I think as 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 uh, David said, uh, there are many ways to strengthen regional cooperation and and. Uh, and for example, I can I just provide a couple of examples of what uh, Erie has been promoting. One is sharing knowledge. That is essential. You know, sharing knowledge on what works, what le works less well, good practices and things like that. So uh, another way of cooperating is actually to make sure that we invest in the next generation. For example, regionally receive students, train students, and make sure that we invest in these training capacities to actually uh, uh, prepare for the future in a regional on a regional basis. And we have a couple of good examples, like, for example, uh, our initiative with a number of uh, Southeast Asian countries, but also South Asian countries on seed without borders, promoting, for example, uh, uh, this easy trade of exchange of seeds uh, from different countries, avoiding long certification, uh, you know, processes, and 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 that is that is something that we have been uh, uh, pursuing, and we would like to expand that to other regions and make sure that countries collaborate more on on these fundamental issues of accessing seeds, and and um, I think one more one more thing for Southeast Asia in particular, we ha there have been 
many talks about the need to revisit the regional integration of, of trade in rice, but very little progress. And we have evidence that the whole region would benefit from, you know, uh, easier trade in rice, you know, surplus area, deficit areas. And there are, there are just fears that, that need to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, overcome to make sure that it happens and that soon we will have a space, an open space for open trade in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, uh, Marco, I think we have uh, the next five minutes to answer two more questions. So I would like to request you to read two more questions, please. I shall do so. Uh, we have a question from Sofia Cavalleri from the Stockholm Environment Institute, and she asks, how can peri-urban interfaces be replanned to ensure sustainable and resilient food systems? And then we also have another question uh, specifically for uh, our research uh, colleagues, I imagine. Um, the question is, in which priority areas can technology adoption support smallholder farmers' income during COVID-19? Thank you, Marco. I think this, uh, the first question, perhaps, I would like to suggest that we go to David uh, Dow. David? Um, thank you, Yerdi. Yeah, I think this is, um, I think this is creating these uh, food system or peri-urban food systems will be something that's, um, you know, has, has been important before COVID-19 and will continue to be, be so afterwards. Um, I think that, what, I think the main thing will be to just find ways to um, create better integration between the whole continuum of rural, peri-urban and urban food systems um, through better infrastructure and connections. Um, we can hope to do increase food production in para-urban areas, but we also need to take account of um, the higher value of land in those areas. We need to take account of sometimes reduced availability of good quality water um, and, and things like that. So in, in some ways it poses a little bit more of a challenge because agriculture is a fundamentally um, land intensive process. Um, but I think, I, th I think the main thing is, you know, I, in you know most of the population anyway in lots of asia is very it's very densely populated and there's huge peri-urban areas and to some extent we're kind of um already in those in a situation like that um so yeah i think this will be important going forward i think the important thing is to integrate different um different different uh, all, all along the whole continuum Thank you, David. This reminds me on the discussion on the rural urban linkages as well. That is very important for, for these regions as well. Uh, on the research questions, maybe, uh, Jean, do you want to uh, tackle that? Yes, I can try. So that's a very broad question. So it's, uh, I cannot pretend I can exhaust it. Uh, and it's uh, because technology adoptions in support of, of uh, incomes that can happen in many ways. So I, I would just perhaps indicate four examples. I mean, one obvious way is to uh, use information and make sure that farmers access uh, technologies to avoid crop failures, for example. You know, information on uh, 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 weather uh, risk, weather hazards, and make sure that they can anticipate that and, and, and respond. So that is one way. That is through technologies like remote sensing, drones, and, and satellites, and things like that. Provided they are, they are trained, of course. There are many barriers to adoption of such technologies, and we need, to, we need to be fully conscious of that. Other ways is to facilitate information through technologies for market access. So, for example, help farmers identify those markets where prices are good, and also where demand is growing. So these new products that consumers are looking for, that's another way uh, 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 technology can, can help. So uh, uh, we, we also uh, can see at the production stage technology helping farmers, for example, in the rice sector, in 
managing uh, irrigation, for example, making sure that they use uh, uh, irrigation efficiently, more efficiently, efficiently by uh, relying on very specific technologies that would just uh, uh, indicate the right uh, uh, quantity of water that can be applied and, and so on. So these are just a few examples that would directly result in increased incomes because it would protect the production level and make sure that it would, the product would be harvested in the best possible conditions. Great examples. Thank you very much, John. Um, well, Marco told me, in fact, we have more questions, but, you know, we, we are already almost one and a half hours. So due to the time constraints, we do apologize that we cannot address all of them. However, we will try to forward these questions to the speakers and they might provide their answers later and Iri would uh, probably try to put some of those uh, uh, answers uh, through social media. Now, um, we have come to the next uh, part of our seminars. I would like to invite Mr. Jong Jin, Jong Jin Kim, officer in charge and deputy regional representative, FAO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, to deliver his thought and analysis on possible way forward. So, Mr. Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jordi. Uh, thank you to all the distinguished speakers uh, for sharing perspectives on the future of the food system, which I found uh, very informative and uh, thought-provoking. I want to thank the excellent audience uh, for the active participation in the discussion as well. I would like to say a few words uh, to point the general way forward. As we all know, food is essential for human life. Unfortunately, food system, which produce, process, store, deliver food to all of us is stressed for many uh, different uh, reasons from different factors. Climate change is increasingly uh, uh, impact uh, on uh, and uh, increase the frequency of natural disaster. Natural resource degradation, uh, degradation of soil, water, air makes it more difficult to produce food needed to feed the still growing population. Now, on top of these uh, stresses, we are facing one more, which is uh, COVID-19. We have to address all of these stresses, uh, particularly uh, because the impact will be harsh for small-scale farmers, fishers, and livestock raisers, who are among the most vulnerable in the society. We have not been making good progress towards achieving the SDG2, which is eliminating hunger uh, over the past few years. And COVID-19 would make it even more challenging. While many interventions uh, are needed uh, by all stakeholders in a wide range of areas, I would like to emphasize the importance of making our food system more resilient. Resilience is important because food system is facing ever more shocks and stresses. Droughts, floods, typhoons, transboundary pests and disease, and now virus. How we can build resilience? I would like to stress the importance of innovation among others. The world around us is changing so rapidly to meet the emerging challenges, we need to come up with uh, new technologies, new processes, and new ways of operating business. I think digitalization is playing a key role in this process. Developing such innovation is not easy, which leads to my second point. Given the complexity of the challenges facing us, Collaboration is essential, as all speakers have mentioned, for innovation as well to flourish. 
we all need to work together. FAO has a long history of collaborating hand in hand with a wide range of development partners. The UN agencies, international organizations, international financial institutions, governments, research institutes, academia, civil society, as well as private sector. We look forward to continuing that collaboration with all of you to develop innovation that will help achieving SDGs, particularly leaving no one behind. In closing uh, my short remarks, I would like to thank International ERI Research Institute for hosting this webinar and the distinguished speakers and audiences for joining us today. Thank you very much. Over to you, Yorgi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kim, for your analysis and important suggestion on how we should move forward. We do highlight uh, the importance of collaboration, working together as all the speakers have already alluded to us. Uh, to safeguard the food systems, we cannot do things uh, by ourselves. We have to work together. Now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Matthew Morel, the Director General of IRI, to give his closing remarks. Dr. Morel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Yodi. And firstly, I'd like to thank you for your excellent moderation of this session. But I'd also like, of course, to extend my thanks again to FAO, ADB, ASEAN and Grow Asia for making this webinar possible. Just to reflect briefly, David Dorr, uh, your comments about learning from each other and promoting effective policies are very important. We must take this forward. Uh, Dr. Jiang Feng Singh, it's very welcome to hear about the policy infrastructure and technology investments, among other measures that ADB is taking. Graham Dixie, uh, really appreciated your comments on the importance of public-private partnerships. This really resonated across practices, technologies, logistics, finances, digital solutions. Uh, we also welcome, of course, the ASEAN statement on the importance of the agri-food sector and the measures of being taken in the region. And thank you, Jongjing Kim, for your comments, uh, touching on the struggles we've been making uh, on SDG2, SDG2 progress and, of course, the importance of resilience and collaboration. I'd really like to thank the over 600 viewers who've joined the webinar and thank you for some terrific and incisive questions. And thank you to our panelists for your answers. So thanks again to the export, uh, experts from all the organizations who took time from their busy schedules to provide insights on this important matter. And I'd really like to encourage that we continue this kind of conversation. And I note uh, the seminar that uh, Grow Asia is running in a few weeks to continue this conversation for the benefit of those who depend on rice-based agri-food systems for sustenance and livelihoods. Please rest assured that IRI is ready to lend its research and expertise in the future development of strategies, technologies, science, measures against crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in terms of its impact on food systems. I hope you got a sense of the commitment and excitement from Dr. Ballier that IRI sees in progressing research to address the impacts of COVID-19, but also the other grand challenges facing the sector. So in closing, uh, just to note that the world is of course no stranger to crisis. But what seems interesting to me about experiencing this crisis is that it has brought broad and more or less consistent action. It can be argued that this is because it's a very democratic crisis. If Boris Johnson or Tom Hanks can't be protected, then why should I think uh, that I can be in the absence of the measures that have been put in place? So my government must act. Yet we face other crises, climate change, uh, population growth, uh, environmental degradation as a number of prominent examples where the effects are more incremental. 
and where the effects are felt by the most vulnerable and are perhaps not even evident to the political and economic classes who run our societies. We struggle to mount responsive responses to those crises that match the coordinated response we've seen to COVID. So we must learn from this. Will the world, like after the 2008 food price crisis, grow complacent again? Or will we take this as a wake up call to address all of the pressing issues of our times, understand their synergies and their interactions and the trade-offs and benefits of particular interactions? There is a huge opportunity for science and technology uh, and evidence-based policy to be the driver of solutions by thinking at a systems level. We must accept this challenge work tirelessly to develop solutions, collaborate strongly, and be powerful advocates for a safer, more sustainable and healthy world. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morrill, for such inspiring closing remarks. With that, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our program. I hope that the seminar today has enriched our knowledge on the food systems. I personally learned a lot. I would like to once again thank our resource persons for their contribution. Dr. Dao, Mr. Kim from FAO, Dr. Zhang from ADB, Dr. Dixie from Grow Asia, Dr. Balier and Dr. Matthew Morrell from ERI. Thanks also to ASEAN for sharing its statement. Of course, thanks to the over 600 participants out there. Some might be evening, some morning in your time. It has been a great seminar. Let's clap for ourselves. And thank you very much. I'm Yurdi Yasmi, the regional representative for Southeast Asia of Erie. Until then, bye for now.